So there's an important assumption in our text this morning. You might have noticed it when Josiah just read it. And it's different than the, what the world around us wants us to think. Our text this morning said, it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. So God says that the default trajectory of sinners is not heaven. That trajectory is not resting in peace, it's not reincarnation, and it's not purgatory. And as those who reject heaven and hell and afterlife, it's also not fading into nothingness. Our passage today says the, that the default trajectory for sinners is judgment. So starting with Adam, every one of us has sinned against God. We have rejected the holy and perfect God to be our own gods. And when we did so, we committed the highest act of treason against the most holy being. We did it against the source of goodness himself. And so this act of treason puts us in the camp of children of wrath like the rest of humanity. And so that's the fundamental problem. That's the problem that our sin creates. And the Bible makes it clear that it's a much bigger problem than we realize. From, generation th from Genesis 3 and on, the whole storyline of the Bible unfolds the solution of how God deals with our sin problem. It deals with the questions like, how do we get back to the way things were in the garden before sin? How can we once again dwell in the presence of a holy God without being destroyed for our sin? How do we rid ourselves of the guilt we know we are guilty of? These are questions that our text in Hebrews sets out to explain. So I'm going to pray, and then we'll jump into the text. Father, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Thank you for speaking truth to us. Thank you that every word in this book is breathed out by you and is profitable for us. Help us receive it this morning and be changed by it. Let it reorient our hearts to long for and to trust in Jesus. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you turn with me to Hebrews 9, verse 23, I'll read from there. Thus, it was necessary for the copies of heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So right away, the author points us back to the old covenant sacrifices. And so in order to understand our text, we need to set the stage by looking back to the day of atonement. So the major thing that you and I have in common with the Israelites, with the Hebrews, is our sin problem. Now, Although they had the same tendency to try to underestimate their sin, it was actually quite a, quite a lot more difficult for them to ignore it. Not only did they have their conscience and the law to remind them of their sin, but they could literally smell it in the air, right? There were millions of sacrifices offered for sin all the time under the old covenant system. Blood and guts and the smell of burning flesh were their constant reminder of the ugliness and the seriousness of sin. They knew sin was the reason for the sacrificial systems and why these animals had to be slaughtered in, in what seemed like an unending system, an unending slaughter, day after day, year after year, generation after generation. And at the very heart of this sacrificial system was one day— called the Day of Atonement. This was a day like no other. It was an especially important and sober day. Like the whole nation would pray and fast leading up to this day. And on that day, the high priest would sacrifice a bull and a goat for his own sins and for the sins of the nation over the past year. And then he would take some of the blood and enter into the Holy of Holies, inside of the tabernacle, modeled after heaven itself, and then he would sprinkle blood on the sacrifice in the presence of God. This is how he made purification for sin. 
What essentially he was doing was cleaning up the mess that their sin had created that year. It was like an annual reset. One way to think about it is like, if you were to acquire such immense credit card debt that you needed someone else, like a donor, just to come every month and make the minimum interest payments to keep the debt collector away. Right? That's, that's what the high priest under the old covenant system was doing. Romans calls it passing over their sins for a time. And so that's what the priests did, and it was a constant reminder of their sin. It was undealt with. The old covenant's day of atonement is this backdrop now for our text in which we see a better new covenant way in Christ's work for us as our high priest. So if you're looking for an outline, the way we'll trace that in our text this morning is by paying attention to the word appear. The word appear shows up three times in our text and it will highlight the main points in the passage. And the first one is, Jesus now appears in heaven for us. Look at verse 24. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. The first difference between Christ's high priesthood and the old priesthood is location. So the the old covenant priests served in a tent on earth that mimicked heavenly reality. It mimicked the throne room of God in heaven. It was a copy. No high priest who entered into the Holy of Holies every year looked around this tent and said, I've made it. Like, this is it. This is the eternal rest that God has for me in his presence. That wasn't it at all. This sinful priest was coming back to make atonement for a sinful year in a tent made by hands on earth that meant to point forward to a future reality. If anything, he was probably wondering, do I have to do this forever? When is the Messiah going to come and deal with this? There was nothing permanent about it. It was a tent, right? A tent is not where you live forever. A tent is where you go camping for a little while, but it's not where you live forever. It's not your home. And so this tent was meant to point them to a future location and the constant sacrifices were a reminder of that. But when we look at our high priest, when we look at Jesus and his new covenant priesthood, he enters a better place. Scripture says he ascended into heaven itself. He entered the actual throne room of God, and then as we saw in Hebrews chapter 1, he sat down. This was the final destination, and its finality is made clear in the words, now to appear. The verse says, Christ entered, past tense, into heaven itself, now to appear, present tense, in the presence of God on our behalf. So our high priest entered heaven itself, and he has not left. So right now, at this very moment, there is a real man with a real body in the unrestricted presence of God. But more than that, he's there for you. Like that's what priests do, they mediate. They represent someone else. Jesus had already been in the presence of God for eternity before becoming a man. But when he ascended as our great high priest, he did so, John 14 reminds us, Right before the ascension, Jesus tells his disciples, I go and prepare a place for you, that you also may be where I am. It's like like a refugee who's waiting to be placed, getting a call from Arrive Ministries saying, we've got a placement for you. We have a home for you. It's been secured, it's reserved. Like, the very fact that our high priest is in heaven for us right now assures us that there's a place reserved 
for us. And it's guaranteed by Jesus himself because of his very presence in heaven right now. So that's, that's why we, we sing songs like, before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love, who ever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hand. My name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue could bid me thence depart. Like our high priest entered heaven itself and is there now guaranteeing a place for us. And that leads us to the second point. Jesus has appeared to deal with sin decisively. Let's look at verse 25. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So the reason the high priests had to repeat their sacrifices every year is because they didn't have a sacrifice sufficient to deal with their sin decisively. And that should remind us that our sin is a much, much bigger deal than we realize. I guess finite creatures, we can't truly grasp the infinite wickedness of our treason against God. Like, against goodness himself, perfect and holy, and to reject him in order to be our own gods, Scripture makes it clear that the just and proportionate punishment for our sin against God is hell. Like, our guilt before God is infinite, so nothing short of perfection is sufficient to rescue us from it. Even 10 million imperfect sacrifice on repeat could not get rid of it. And that's why verse 27 is so serious. It is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. This warning that our default trajectory as sinners is to face the judgment of God is heavy. It should be but it's actually a mercy. See, true cruelty is offering someone false hope and reassurance when they're headed for destruction. Hebrews doesn't do that. It doesn't offer any false hope. It warns us of reality. If you reject Jesus, there is no hope for you. Nothing you could ever do would be enough to pay for your own sin. And so the warning here is God's mercy because he loves you and he's made a real way to deal with your sin decisively. That's why the second appear in verse 26 brings us back to the cross. Christ has appeared once, once for all, at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So only a perfect sacrifice can deal with sin decisively, and Jesus is that perfect sacrifice. Jesus was the only man who lived the perfect life that we couldn't live, and then died in our place so that whoever puts their trust in him, his death counts for you. His perfect sacrifice decisively deals with the sins of all those who trust in him. Like we remembered and sang last week, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Only his sacrifice for our sin is sufficient to pay for it once for all. So when our high priest entered into heaven for us, he entered victoriously because he had dealt with our sin on the cross decisively. He is not only the perfect high priest, but he is also the perfect sacrifice who paid for what we deserve. And so our forgiveness is complete because his sacrifice was enough for us. He didn't just pass over. He didn't just clean up. He declares you not guilty. You are forgiven completely. 
God says, I will remember your sins no more. So that's reality. That's reality for the Christian. His death for us means we're totally forgiven. Every past, present, and future sin has been paid for on the cross. Now, if that's not you, if you haven't put your trust in Jesus, I invite you to do that today. You today can ask God to forgive you your sins and to give you a new life. His sacrifice, his death is sufficient for your sins. And if you have questions about that, I'd love to talk to you after the service. So there's real hope for us because a perfect sacrifice has been made for our sin. And I'd like to take a moment briefly to to mention the feeling of guilt. Because our complete forgiveness does not mean that every feeling of guilt will go away on this side of eternity. Like, it's, it's one of the realities, our feelings of guilt, of not being home yet. So what do you do if you've put your trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, but you can't shake the feeling of guilt? Right? Whether that's guilt from remaining sin that you're still fighting in your life, or if it's for past sins that keep popping up, reminding you of shame and guilt. I want you to know that this is the place for you. The church is where those who are completely forgiven but not home yet come, and they come together to remember that we are completely forgiven that our sins are put away and God remembers them no more. And we remind each other of that by looking together and pointing ourselves and one another to Christ's sacrifice on the cross for us. So back to that song, when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because a sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. He has dealt with your sins decisively on the cross. And as the church, we remember that together as we look forward to coming home. And that brings us to our third and final point. Jesus will appear to welcome us home. If you look at verse 27 and 28, just as it's appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Christian, Jesus is coming back for you. You're not home yet, but you will be. One day, a real day, just like today, your eyes will see Jesus. You will have a glorified body, you will have no more trace of sin, and you will be welcomed home to a place secured for you in the presence of God in heaven. Like Hebrews makes it clear that because Jesus dealt with decisively our sins at his first coming, we have nothing to fear at his second coming. In fact, Hebrews tells us that we should be eagerly waiting for his return, for the Savior who is coming to welcome us home. These verses aren't here to guilt trip you about your lack of eagerness. He's reminding you, he's stirring up your eagerness by showing you the eternal inheritance that's really there for you. Now, it can be hard to imagine being welcomed by Jesus the way that the Bible describes. And I think in part it's because like, we, we can't in our finite imaginations truly imagine ourselves without any sin. Like we know it to be true, we are forgiven, and we believe that there will be no trace of sin when Jesus comes back for us. But it's so, it's so far from our current experience that it's, it's hard to imagine it. It's like 
we can't help but think that there will always be a, a small trace of disappointment when God welcomes us in heaven. And that's, and that's a lie that can very, very quickly kill eagerness for his return. And one thing that helps me in this is um, I look to the father's love for his son. I, I imagine what it looked like when the father welcomed Jesus in heaven. Like when Jesus ascended into heaven victorious, perfect, righteous. And I, I picture the father's words, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Can you imagine that? You might not be able to imagine yourself without any trace of sin, but you can imagine that. The perfect, righteous Jesus being embraced by his Father. Christian, you will be received by the Father with the same love that he has for his Son. He will delight in you and embrace you and smile on you like he does his Son. And so that helps me imagine my welcome. You will be radiant like a bride adorned for her husband. There will be no trace of sin, no guilt, no disappointment. You will be clothed in Jesus' perfect righteousness. You are united to Christ. When the Father looks on you, he sees his perfect son, and he loves you. He gave his son for you. And so nothing in this world will compare to the Father's smile towards you when he welcomes you in heaven. And so two brief points of application this morning to help us foster our eagerness for Christ's return. The first one is let's daydream about heaven. Like let's feed our affections for it. Nothing I can imagine or dream up can surpass or even come close to what actually awaits for us when Jesus returns. Like your eagerness, your anticipation will never outpace what's in store for you. And that's good news. Like we can let the joys and the daydreams of this life, like the good things of earth are a helpful tool for us in this. Like, let, let the sunrise and the best feast and the mountains and, and the joy of, of marriage, the gift of getting coffee with an old friend, the, the smile of your child towards you, let every one of those good gifts remind you that it's just a taste. It's just a taste for what's to come. It's meant to foster our eagerness for a much, much better joy waiting for us at home. Pastor Joe has a whole book written on this topic called The Things of Earth, and I, I strongly recommend reading that to help us daydream about heaven. And the second thing is be homesick for the redemption of all things. Like this world has many good gifts, but it's also full of sorrows and brokenness. And many of these sorrows and brokenness run so deep that they cannot fully be redeemed in this life. And we know that. But scripture reminds us that when Jesus comes back, he will make all things new. The former things will pass away and every sorrow will be finally and completely redeemed. So your sufferings at this present time are not worth comparing to the glories that will be revealed. And so because of that, we can hope in this life and take heart in Revelation 21 here and now. We can be homesick for that final redemption of all things. Revelation 21 says, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, 
and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. There will be no mourning or crying or pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. We will dwell with him. He will redeem everything, and he will make all things new when he returns for us. And that brings us to the table, because 1 Corinthians 11 says, when we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Like, we say to one another, he's coming back for you. And until he does, his death is sufficient for you. Right? There's, there's, no, there's no break between the two. Every Sunday when we reach out and take the bread and the wine, we're looking back to the death of Jesus in our place and saying, his death is sufficient for my sins. It's sufficient until the day that he comes back for me. And so if that's you today, if you put your trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you're waiting for him, you're invited to take communion with us this morning. If that's not you, I ask that you let the elements pass, but don't let the moment pass. Receive Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and trust him for all God's promises to you. Pastors will distribute the bread first and then we'll hold on to it and eat together. His body is the true bread. Let us serve you.